This way, folks, if you're watching and you're looking at the bookshelf over my shoulder here and you see the book with the black cover and it has the interesting sort of humanoid-like features on it, we're over here giggling about how that artwork, which is really very ancient artwork, might look like aliens to you. And it's really a book about uh, African astronomy. And these are cave drawings from a very long time ago uh, that were used in African uh, art. So that's what you're seeing over there. Okay. So that's why we adjusted the camera up so you could see the title of the book actually. Okay, Katie, are we live? Okay, fabulous. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Night Skies at Home. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum, your cool astronomer, welcoming you to another edition of our really wonderful program that helps you get out underneath the night sky to enjoy what's there to be seen in the heavens. Now, I know this year, uh, or right now anyway, it's a pretty cold time for those of us here on the East Coast who might wanna get out and check out the skies, but we might feel a little deterrent to that because the air is so nippy at night. But uh, indeed, this is a good time to get out and observe the evening skies. There are lots of really wonderful and bright constellations that are very, very easy for you to see. And uh, I invite you to step outside on maybe one of the warmer evenings, or if you like that good chill, get out on a nice clear evening and take a look at the evening sky. This program, Night Skies at Home, is a program that is our virtual version, if you will, of a program that we've done at the Franklin Institute for a very long time, Night Skies at the Observatory. And we invite people to come down to the museum, come up to the observatory and to the fifth floor roof deck and enjoy a view of the night sky from downtown Center City, Philadelphia using our telescopic equipment. We also incorporate use of the planetarium and we have lots of activities and all sorts of great things going on on those evenings once a month. But since we can't be in the museum because of the pandemic, here we are now online live bringing this to you so you can do this at home on your own. Now this program provides information that's usable by anyone. You don't have to be an expert to enjoy this program or to use the content of this program. In fact, this program is meant to give you the tools you need as an introductory way to begin your course in learning the night sky and connecting with the night sky. You know, these days when things are so challenging for us, this is a really wonderful way to sort of decompress a little bit, to relax a little bit and reconnect with the universe. You step outside in the evening, gaze up at the sky and just take in the light that comes down from stars and let your imagination wander out into the universe as you fill in the picture of the sky as you see it. So we're gonna give you some of the keys and guides you need to make that happen so that while you're out, you'll know some signposts, you'll recognize some markers, you'll know where you are in the universe. Okay, so we welcome you to the program. We do this on the first Thursday night of every month, starting at about 7.45, and we welcome you uh, to our program this evening. We really wanna hear your questions. That's really important to us. So please think of astronomy questions that you wanna ask us, and uh, I'll do what I can to answer your questions for you. So uh, tonight we have a couple of very important messages and important pieces to the program. Uh, first of all, in honor of Black History Month, I've asked Dr. Gabor Basri, an, an astrophysicist from University of California, Berkeley, to join us this evening to talk about some of the work that he's done in astronomy. And you know, we're in for a real treat because as it turns out, Dr. Basri is the discoverer of one of the most numerous types of stars in any galaxy. So we're gonna hear about his work with those kinds of stars. But Dr. Basri has also done a tremendous amount of work trying to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion at UC Berkeley. And so we'll talk a bit about that too, because as we've all come to learn, uh, access into the sciences for people of color has been challenging over the years, over the decades. And so these days we're seeing more of an effort to see to it that these barriers are eliminated so that everyone can enjoy and contribute to science. And so Dr. Basri is gonna talk with us about that a little bit this evening as well. Probably the most important message I can give you folks is wear a mask, wear a mask, you know why, and get vaccinated. Yep, that's right, wear a mask and get vaccinated. This is for the good of everybody. Yes, it's for the good of your loved ones, someone right in your family, you can protect in this way, but it's also for the good of everybody else 
on the planet. So wear a mask and get vaccinated. So what else are we gonna do tonight? Uh, tonight happens to be the uh, birth anniversary of Clyde Tumbaugh. 115 years ago, the discoverer of Pluto was born. And I think it fitting that tonight on the birthday of uh, Clyde Tumbaugh, we also have another discoverer of a significant component of the cosmos overhead, Dr. Basri, who will be with us a little bit later. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the constellations that are available for us to see, what planets are available for us to see. We'll talk a little bit about your telescopes and don't forget, we want your questions, okay? So thanks for joining us again. This is another edition of Night Skies at Home, the Franklin Institute's virtual at-home program about astronomy, inviting you to join to learn about the night skies. Again, I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute, your cool astronomer. So let's get started with tonight's program. Uh, we're going to get started with tonight's program. Remember I asked you uh, about questions? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check in to see if you have any questions just yet. And if you don't, we'll roll on into some other stuff and then we'll come back to you. So I'm going to ask my studio producer right here, the lovely Linda over here on the, say, hi, uh, on the side. Say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. Okay, Linda's going to help me with questions. As you send them into the comments section, my museum studio technician, Katie, who's out there. Hi, Katie. Thanks a lot. Katie's going to feed those over to Linda. Linda will feed them on to me. We'll get the mask and maybe we'll, we'll be able to answer some of them. Okay, so let's check in. Anything yet, Linda? Well, first we have a shout out from Alvin who said he saw the ISS tonight from downtown Philly in the northern sky. Wow, Alan, that's great. You saw International Space Station flying over Philadelphia. Yeah, that was uh, right after six o'clock this evening, I think. And uh, Alan, I, I think when you were out seeing it, you probably didn't have any difficulty seeing it. Nice and bright flying over Philadelphia. I hope that wasn't your first time seeing it. And if it was, I hope you go back and do that again often because that's a great observation to make. And you know, anybody can see International Space Station. Alan, I gotta tell you, that's one of my favorite observations is seeing International Space Station, but even more so, I love showing it to other people. And guess what folks, we're all gonna have a chance to see International Space Station if the weather holds together Saturday evening over Philadelphia, starting at 625 in the evening over in the West Northwest, International Space Station is going to fly overhead at a maximum height of 39 degrees. So it starts at 625. It's going to reach a maximum altitude of 39 degrees and then disappear about six or seven minutes later, way over on the southeastern horizon. So I'll show you a guide where you can get more information about this tonight, and then you'll get the details, and then you can invite some friends to come out with you and see it as long as the sky remains clear. Let's see if there's another question. What do you have, Linda? Paul wants to know, are there any tips on how to start astrophotography? Paul wants to know if there are any tips on how to start astrophotography. Yeah, first things first, get yourself a decent camera to do this work with. The, work, the cameras that are used these days to do this work actually are um, DSLRs, digital single lens reflex cameras. These are digital, photo dig digital cameras that have the capability to have their ISO, that would be the, how would I describe that? That would be a setting on the camera that allows the camera to gather plenty of light from dim objects like stars so that you can get a really, really good image. And those kinds of cameras are really good to use because what they do is they provide that really wonderful opportunity to get you, to give you really good images of the sky without having to do exposures of hours and hours and hours. That's the beauty of this right now. So how do you get started with this? Well, uh, it's a complicated process to get started with. And the best way to do this actually is I recommend that you go online and actually look up the, you know, the, the, the steps that you need to get started. But I'm going to start you with this. First of all, you're going to need a camera that has the capability to have its ISO adjusted really high so you can do that kind of work. You're also going to need a good stable tripod. You're going to need a spot where the sky is dark and clear to do this from. And then what you're going to learn how to do is you're going to learn how to take a series of very short exposure images, say a half second or a second or so, and you'll take what's called a stack of these. So you'll take a number of these one second images and then using software to put these images together, you're gonna to take that stack and reduce it all together, eliminate the noise that comes from the electronics in the digital chip that's, uh, the chip that's in the camera, the detector chip that's in the camera that accepts the light. And 
you're going to use you're going to do the uh, the the work that you need on that uh, sort of like Photoshop in a way to put that all together so that you get it again can get a decent digital image. So uh, I really recommend that you go online and check out places where you can find lessons in how to do this. And in that way, you'll get all the instructions you need for how to make that happen. Okay, so that's a great question. Thanks a lot. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump all um, jump over and take a look at what's available in the evening sky right now uh, for just a few minutes before we uh, meet with our guest, Dr. Basri. And so I want to get that done first, and then we'll come back and we'll begin that. We'll do some more questions later. Thanks a lot for your questions so far. All right, so here's what you need to know about what's happening in the sky right now these days, the sky phenomena that you'll need to know. First of all, Sunrise is now coming at 7.04 a.m. 7.04 a.m. around here in the Philadelphia area at 40 degrees north latitude. So across the country, it'll be the same, except for, you know, we have the, the changes in time a little bit there. But 7.04, as you go further north, it'll be a little later. As you go further south, it'll be a little bit earlier. You'll see how that works out. But this is a great change from what it was just last month. This is now 20 minutes better than last month. And sunset comes at 525 in the evening. So you can see that we're now adding minutes of daylight as we make our way from winter into spring. Earlier this week, February 2nd, you know what day that was? You know that was a special day, right? You know which one it was? Yeah, it was Groundhog Day. That's true. Well, Groundhog Day has an astronomical significance because Groundhog Day, February 2nd, is what's called a cross quarter day. And this is the day that's halfway between the beginning at the end of one season uh, and the beginning of another season. I'm sorry, it's halfway between the beginning of one season and the beginning of the next season. So great, thank you very much. Okay, so um, where was I now? Oh yes, that's right. So February 2nd, Groundhog Day is a cross quarter day halfway between the first day of winter and the first day of spring. I like to think of it like this. Here we are now, halfway between. We can see how we're gaining minutes of sunlight. It's only six weeks approximately until spring. I cut it a little short just to make me feel better about how much more snow we might get. But you get my point. We're not far from spring at all right now. And that day, February 2nd, Groundhog Day, is one of those halfway points. Now, here's a challenge for you. Go to a calendar, look at when the next seasons are, and see if you can figure out where the cross quarter day falls, halfway between the beginning of the last season and the beginning of the next season, and see if you can figure out what the colloquial name is for that cross quarter day. Like we say, Groundhog Day. Well, there are names for some of the other ones. See if you can figure out what they are. Some of them are gonna be really interesting and familiar. Some you're gonna find are really obscure and you would have never known what they were going to be. But check it out, you'll find it really fascinating. It's a throwback to how people used to divide up the year according to the seasons to help with agricultural activities. So check that out. Okay, so now the moon today is 22 days old. It is a waning gibbous phase right now. Uh, and it rises at 1.08 in the morning. It sets at 12.32 p.m. The next time we come around to new moon, is next Thursday. Next Thursday, February 11th is new moon. And then we come to full moon on the 27th of this month, almost right there at the last day. Now, last month when we talked about what was great to see in the sky, we talked about the planets Jupiter and Saturn as being wonderful to see. They were still hanging up over in the low southwestern portion of the sky after sunset, but only for a short amount of time. And this was after a long time, many, many months of wonderful observing of these two gas giant planets even as they slid around the sky and merged with each other uh, in, in the great conjunction that happened uh, back in December. Well, as it turns out, time has moved on, the earth has moved on and our changing position in the night sky has now taken those planets away from our view for a little, bit, for a little while, but we still have Mars hanging high in the Western sky after sunset. So you can still see that without any difficulty at all. And uh, that's the only planet we really have available. We talked a little bit about Venus in the morning before sunrise, but now Venus has slipped closer to the sun, closer to sunrise. So that makes it very, very difficult to see. It makes it a big challenge to see that. Let's give that up. Right now we have Mars. Things will improve as the year goes on, but right now that's where we are. 
for constellations in the evening sky right now. We'll look at a map a little bit later, but the major ones that you can even get started with yourself right now are the ones that are in the winter circle, the winter circle of constellations that are centered on Orion the Hunter. Now, Orion is a big major constellation and we've spoken about a number of times, but it is encircled by a group of other bright constellations that are really, really great to find in the sky. They are Auriga, the charioteer, Taurus, the bull, Canis Major, the big dog, the big hunting dog of Orion, Canis Minor, the smaller hunting dog of Orion, and the constellation Gemini, the twins. So we have two zodiac constellations in there, and that would be Taurus and Gemini, the twins. And Gemini is typically a constellation that we use to herald the coming of spring. So now that we can see these in the evening sky, and I'm talking really right now, at around 8 o'clock or 8.30 in the evening, looking toward the south, you can see this nice circle of constellations. Uh, you have constellations way over in the west that are left over from the fall, and you have Gemini hanging high in the southeastern sky, and that's bringing along behind it the rest of the constellations of spring. And as the month continues on, we'll see more of those constellations. We'll take a look at a star map a little bit later so we can see those. And uh, we'll be able to uh, figure out where those are and give you a guide to get started with them. OK, great. So uh, those are those constellations. And uh, we're all good for that. We talked a little bit about Space Station already. I'll describe that again. Uh, but that takes care of uh, the basics for the night sky. And we'll come back and we'll look at a map a little bit later so that we can actually see where they are and you can figure out how to get started identifying those constellations. Well, tonight, as I mentioned earlier, we have a guest star with us this evening. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Gabor Basri, uh, was able to join us this evening. Uh, he's on the line now. I'm going to uh, take just a moment to uh, introduce. I'm sorry, hon? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it's going to take us just a moment to connect. We'll get that all done and get the images uh, squared away and things like that. But just let me give you a quick background on uh, Dr. Basri so you'll understand who we actually have the pleasure and honor of chatting with this evening. Dr. Gabor Basri received his B BS in physics in 1973 from Stanford University, his PhD in astrophysics from University of Colorado in Boulder in 1979, and he started on the faculty at University of California, Berkeley in 1982, becoming a full professor in 1994. Dr. Basri is an expert on stellar formation, but particularly of T tauri stars. But he is the leading authority on the most numerous type of stars in the galaxy, the brown dwarf stars, which he discovered in 1995. Dr. Basri also invented a method of dating stars called lithium dating, which has revised our understanding of the ages of young stars and star clusters like the Pleiades. Through his work on brown dwarf stars, he's also become a leading authority on planetary formation. Uh, in the early 2000s, he was a co-investigator on NASA's Kepler mission, Kepler's, Ke NASA's Kepler, I'm sorry, NASA's Kepler mission that was extraordinarily successful in identifying planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. The work of Kepler continues on these days, and this was one of the first ways that we were able to definitively understand that there were planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy, and the numbers on those keep going up, in fact, the number of planets and planetary candidates that have been identified. That's really remarkable work. He's written about 200 technical publications and has more than 20,000 citations, which is amazing, absolutely incredible. That means that people have used his work over and over and over and over again in their astronomical work. And, and that's the real sign of a, a truly remarkable scientist is how their work is used over and over and over again. He serves on numerous committees, helping to award uh, major research grants for NASA, for the National Science Foundation, and also for the Keck Observatories, where he has worked on those big telescopes in the past. In 2006, Dr. Basri was appointed Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion at Berkeley, serving in that position for eight years. He's now Professor Emeritus and serves, as I do, on the board of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. He recently co-chaired a committee for the American Astronomical Society 
on making graduate education more inclusive. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gabor Basri. Good evening, Gabor. Hey, Derek, how are you? Nice. I'm very good. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It really is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks a lot. Well, my pleasure too. So, you know, I, I've got to tell you, Gabor, uh, you know, we've known each other for a little while now, and I've always been impressed with, uh, you know, uh, the work that, that, that I've seen you, you done through Astronomical Society of the Pacific and in many other places. But, you know, I got to tell you, when I really dug into your bio and learned about all of the incredible astronomical research work that you've done, you know, you really stand head and shoulders above the crowd of everybody else out there doing really fantastic work. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that, but I, I have had a pretty successful career. I, you know, there, I have a lot of colleagues who are, are also very uh, successful, uh, with who I enjoy working with. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I need to be modest about it. But yes, it's, it's been a, a ton of fun. <laughs> I really yeah. had a great Time. Good. That's right. So, so uh, Gabor, can, tell us, tell our audience, if you will, how was your interest in astronomy first generated? You know, that's that's uh, people ask me that, and I don't really know. I just know that it was early uh, when I was in uh, probably first first or second grade. I, I think the thing that I remember is that I started reading, you know, these kid kid science fiction books. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, uh, wow, outer space sounds really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, when I was growing up, also the, the um, Apollo uh, program was underway and, uh, you know, space travel was just, just becoming a thing for humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that that helped as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, I was, I was interested uh, from, from early on. Did you know any astronomers when you were growing up as a child and interested in astronomy? You know, I didn't know any astronomers. Uh, the person I knew, uh, and I guess I got to know him in, when, when I was like seventh grade, uh, was a science fiction author, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. He's, he's the guy who wrote um, 2001. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was because I was living in Sri Lanka for a year at that time, and he, he lived in Sri Lanka, uh, even though he was English. Uh, and we ended up turned out we were at, at the same um, pool, swimming pool club. Uh, and so oh, wow. <laughs> I got to know him. They, they, uh, he, he told me at that time, he says, uh, you know, I'm working on this movie with Stanley Kubrick. And, you know, it'll, it'll be ready. Uh, it'll be released, you know, when you go back to the U.S. So make sure you catch it. <laughs> that, was, that was 2001. Um, uh, so that, that was cool. You went to see the movie, I hope. Oh, I totally went to see the movie. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> And he actually came over and visited us um, in Colorado where I, where I lived because he did some color commentary for the uh, Apollo missions. So when he came over later in the 60s, uh, he, we, he visited. Um, but to answer your other question, I, uh, I did a career report on astronomy when I was in eighth grade. So, you know, you had to do a report on some career. I, I was interested sure. in astronomy then. All right. Um, and I looked into it and I decided that wouldn't be a very good career because uh, there were so few astronomers, especially at that time, there were maybe a thousand astronomers in the whole country. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looked like it was hard to get into and hard to get to and so on. Um, but my father uh, encouraged me to, he said, well, yeah, okay, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but if you study physics, you can, uh, you have all kinds of opportunities, including astronomy, that'll leave the door open for you. Um, and so that's what I did. I studied physics in, in college. Uh, and I still, again, I still, I thought, you know, this is, this is fun, but it's hard, uh, but it's only really fun if I do it, do astrophysics. You know, I still, still want to be an astronomer. <laughs> so um, I said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go to graduate school in, in astrophysics and we'll see, we'll see if the career happens or not. Uh, and it did for me. Wow, yeah, that's 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 really fascinating. And you know what? That's that's interest. That's wonderful advice your father gave because in in, in many ways, advice like that is still applicable. You know, oh yeah, you, definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's really wonderful. That's really wonderful. Now, in your career, though, you really have done some exciting stuff. And you know, uh, I, I wish we could have I wish we could have you know a, an hour or two hours to talk about it. And there's so much that we have to sort of. I don't want to say leave out, but 
but there's some really exciting, I mean, it's all exciting, but in particular, um, can we talk a little bit about the work that, that you've done, Gabor, with the Titori stars and the brown dwarf stars? And, uh, you know, our audience here, certainly interested in astronomy, but may not know uh, very much uh, in depth about Titori stars or about brown dwarf stars, but there's high significance in both of those. Tell us a little bit about the work that you did with that. Sure. Um, it was... Um... Well, let me, let me say when I was in graduate school, the, the subject I took up first was um, stellar magnetic activity. So our sun is, is you know, magnetically active. It has sunspots, it has flares, it has the corona mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so that was the topic I was originally started on. Uh, and at that also at the time I graduated with my doctorate, uh, it was the first time we had a, a telescope in space that could observe stars in, in the ultraviolet, the, the part, part of the, the spectrum that our ozone layer blocks. So mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't do it from the ground. You have to, to be above the atmosphere. Sure. Uh, but that's the best uh, region to study stellar magnetic activity. So I was, I was all excited about that. Um, and then I, when I moved to Berkeley, uh, I, I knew I needed to broaden, sort of broaden my interests. Um, so T. Tauri stars are, uh, that's just the name of a particular star that's an example of them. What, what you should, I, I won't use that name anymore. I'll say uh, newly born stars. Okay. That's the, <laughs> the better way to, to describe them. So uh, at, the at that time, this was in the early 80s. Um, we didn't really know much about star formation, but we had a suspicion that these, these Titori stars were, were very young stars. Um, and we didn't know whether they were still uh, gathering material from their birth cloud or you know why, and they we did know they looked really uh, active, strangely active, mm -hmm. kind of kind of in the way the sun is active, but much more so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then even beyond that, uh, and so people were were trying to figure out is is this like super magnetic activity, or is this something to do with the actual formation of the star? So that's how I got into it. I came into it from the magnetic activity side, but. Um, Pretty soon we started figuring out that, yeah, actually these stars are still accreting material. The star is still forming. Um, on the other hand, they are extremely magnetically active, uh, far more than the sun. Uh, they, the uh, X-ray flux that comes off of their corona is like a thousand times brighter than, than from our sun. Wow, <laughs> so, wow. So very much more active. Mm -hmm. um, and yet some of, the, some of the activity that we see isn't, due to the magnetic fields is due to the actual accretion of material onto the star. But the fields are so strong that uh, they actually control the final drop of, of material onto the star at, at that time. And so that was the work that I, I did. Uh, we, we used uh, spectroscopy, which is, you know, so we couldn't, we actually, you can't see any of this happening. Mm -hmm. Although actually now these days with modern uh, technology, you can see that the disks of gas and dust around these stars. So what we learned was that star formation proceeds, you have this big cloud of interstellar gas, mm -hmm. uh, it gets dense enough that it starts to collapse, mm -hmm. uh, it has some spin as it collapses like a skater pulling her arms in, uh, it starts spinning faster and faster. It spins so fast that uh, actually stuff is in orbit <laughs> and then it, then it can't really fall any, any further, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, can, it can drop towards the mid plane because that's not pulling it closer to the axis. So that's the whole, the cloud end, it ends up flattening down into a, a disk and the disk is in orbit around the star. And depending on how much spin each particular part of parcel of gas had, it'll land in a different place on the disk. So you get this whole disk around the star. Mm -hmm. And by the way, of course, that's how planet, that's where planets are formed. And that's why planet formation turns out to be so common because it's actually, uh -huh. You know, it's just a, a byproduct of the way stars form, essentially. Sure. Uh, so we began to, to uh, we couldn't see these disks at that time, but we could tell spectroscopically that they must be there uh, because you could kind of see that you could see the star, uh, and yet there was all this infrared light coming from a huge amount of gas and dust around it. Mm -hmm. And if that was spread uniformly around the star, you'd never be able to see the star through it. So there's a lot of gas and dust, but it wasn't blocking our view in, in many cases. So that must be a disk, we said. Um, and we could see the, 
we could see the spectroscopic signature of, of gas actually falling falling onto the star. When it hit the star, it would uh, you know get really hot and so produce a lot of ultraviolet light, and we could now see that with our ultraviolet telescopes. Um, and so we were putting all this this whole story together. Mm -hmm. um, and then as time went on, our observing techniques got better and better. We started to actually be able to image those those discs, and, wow. and that's gotten gotten great these days. So there's tons of nice Im images of actual disks around stars. They even have rings and gaps where planets may be forming. Uh, we can actually image that now, but we couldn't do it at the time. Incredible. Uh, it must have been very exciting uh, doing that work at that time when you know so little was known. Did you find it to be really exciting to yeah, be sort of like I, on the you know, cutting edge discovering all this stuff? Well, that's, you know, that's the fun of science is you, uh, you, you work on this stuff and you, uh, you know, you try to prove it and your colleagues, you know, criticize it and you fix it. And, uh, and eventually people say, you know, yeah, that, that's, that seems to be right. Uh, and then you can say, you know, well, I've, I've, I've pushed human knowledge forward, you know, here's something we didn't used to know, uh, and now we know it. And, and I had something to do with that. So that's that, that is very exciting. So uh, tell us you know, now, now I'm an old codger and I, you know, I read, uh, I read textbooks in astronomy, you know, and they say, oh, you know, uh, we know that star formation is, you know, proceeds this way. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we know that because <laughs> of the work we were doing, you know, that I was part of, but, but now it's just accepted knowledge, basically. So it, it's, fun, it's also fun to see your work end up as just, you know, statements of fact in a, in a textbook. <laughs> I'll bet that's exciting. I'll bet that's really exciting. So, so tell us how did how does this connect now to uh, how does this connect now to brown dwarf stars? I I've always been interested in and excited about this story of uh, of brown dwarf stars, uh, and so uh, I think that, you know people would be very much interested to understand a little bit about about brown dwarf stars. Yeah, so brown dwarfs are. Um, uh... They're not, they're not fully stars. Uh, some, some people call them failed stars. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they look like stars when they start, when they're young. And so, you know, I, I studied young, young stars, so I, I study young brown dwarfs as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the idea, the difference between a brown dwarf and a, and a, a regular star is that a regular star uh, uh, collapses in the same way. So it turns out brown dwarfs are formed the same way that I just described stars being formed. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, once you have the, the object there though, uh, it continues to contract. Uh, so it, when it forms, it's, it's, it's kind of bloated uh, and it's actually putting out more energy than it's going to when it's a star. Uh, the gravitational energy that's being lost as it contracts actually turns out to be a more efficient way to, to produce energy than, than nuclear fusion. Wow. Okay. So, these, so even our sun, you know, when it was, uh, when it was still forming, it was like 40 times brighter than it is now. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, but stars settle down uh, to some level of brightness and then they maintain that by uh, nuclear fusion. So the sun is converting hydrogen to helium mm -hmm. and that's where it gets its energy. And, you know, it's, it goes for 10 billion years like that. Um, the brown dwarfs, uh, well, the, the smaller stars also do this, uh, but they are um, less enthusiastic about it. <laughs> uh, and so they, uh, uh, a star that's half the, the mass of the sun is only like a thousandth the brightness. It's a thousand times fainter. Uh, it's wow. being very parsimonious about its uh, burning of mm -hmm. nuclear fuel, which mm -hmm. means that they live far longer. So uh, the sun will be dead after 10 billion years, but one of these red dwarf stars, uh, these, these small ones, uh, might live for hundreds of billions of years or even wow. a trillion years. Wow. Um, now the brown dwarfs are even smaller, or I should say even less massive. Mm -hmm. uh, they are smaller too, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that something weird happens with, with uh, stars that are that small. Uh, they're, so, they're so dense, they get so dense as they contract that they, it turns out they don't need nuclear fusion to hold themselves up anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I left out the part about why, you know, why does the star want to burn its <laughs> hydrogen to helium? Oh, well, yeah. gravity is trying to crush it. Right. Uh, and if the star is going to avoid being crushed into a black hole, it needs to generate some kind of energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, with brown dwarfs, though, they don't have to because uh, the, cent the central parts of them get so dense 
that it's just uh, electrons that are packed in there. Uh, and because of certain quantum effects, the electrons can just hold the thing up. And ah. so the, the brown dwarfs don't, they don't achieve the uh, core densities and temperatures that you would need to, to burn the hydrogen into helium. They're happy with, uh, you know, I'll, I, I'll just do it with electron pressure. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so then they don't shine um, like stars. So, but, you know, they, they start hot. Yeah. So they are, um, they, it's not that they're black. They, they, they start looking like red dwarfs actually, but mm -hmm. then they just start fading out and cooling. Uh, and the, the older a brown dwarf is, the, the fainter and cooler it is. So if we could put this in, in context with what folks might already know about some stars, uh, some, some, some folks already understand that uh, stars like uh, red giant stars, for example, uh, are very, very cool, and, and, you know, relatively speaking, and they come to identify that red color in stars as being the coolest stage in a star that they can yeah. easily see. And they understand that the temperature, you know, of something like that might be somewhere around uh, 6,000 degrees, 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but so at what temperature would a, uh, would a brown dwarf star check in at? Well, you'll have to excuse me. I don't use Fahrenheit. <laughs> okay, we can excuse uh, you for that. No problem. We use, uh, we use Kelvins, which, yes. which is like Celsius, except it starts from zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. Anyway, it doesn't matter with stars because they're thousands of degrees. Um, so I, I, the sun is 6,000 degrees, mm -hmm, right. Kelvin. Mm -hmm. um, a red giant and also these red dwarfs will be somewhere like three or 4,000 degrees. So like half, half as hot as the sun. Mm -hmm. um, a brown dwarf, uh, when it's young and, and it's hottest, it'll start around there. It'll start at two to 3,000 degrees, mm -hmm. and then, but then it cools. So the, the, the oldest brown dwarfs that we have discovered are more like 400 degrees. <laughs> so, so they just keep cooling wow. until they, you know, they reach the, the temperature of, the, actually that's a temperature that's not very different than the earth. Right. <laughs> and then they'll, you know, the universe hasn't been around long enough to get them even colder, but it, they will continue to cool. Um, and, 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 you know, keep dropping. The temperature just keeps dropping. And I understand these are also quite numerous in galaxies. Uh, you know, they're, they're numerous. They're actually not as numerous as stars. There's about, about as a fifth or a sixth as many brown dwarfs as there are stars. Okay. Right. Um, but, uh, but that's still a lot, right? So yeah. billions and billions. Uh, yeah. You know, so 300 billion stars in our galaxy. So, you know, there's, you know, uh, tens of billions of brown dwarfs in our galaxy. Um, uh, so yeah, they're, they're fairly common. Uh, it turn, turns out planets are, are also more common though, because uh, each star may have more than one planet, so. Sure, uh, right, so you can have many, many more. Now, yeah. uh, this work that, you, that you've done is, it, it, particularly with the drowned, brown dwarf stars, is, is also a point of discovery. I mean, if, if I understand it correctly, uh, your work using the 10 meter Keck telescopes at Mauna Kea Observatory uh, provided some of the uh, first data gathered about uh, these kinds of stars. Is that right? Yeah, you know, um, we, were, we were looking for them <laughs> in, the, in the 80s and early 90s, um, people, there were, there were people had done the theory of what they should, should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and we couldn't think of any reason why nature wouldn't make them. Uh, <laughs> but no one had actually discovered the brown dwarf. Now we knew they were you know, faint and cool. So yeah, okay, they're gonna be harder to find. Mm. Uh, but we were, so we were looking. Uh, the 10 meter telescopes uh, were being built at that time. They were designed by someone in the, in the University of California system and Caltech joined us and helped finance them. And so uh, the astronomers in the University of California and Caltech had uh, almost all the time on these 10 meter telescopes at, at the beginning. Uh, wow. So we felt very privileged, oh, but yeah. we also felt a big responsibility. It's like, okay, these telescopes are twice as big as any telescope that's been in existence. Yeah. Uh, we should all do something very significant with right, it. <laughs> right, you should discover something so, major. Think, think about, you know, well, so what is it that I could do that, you know, would, would be quite significant that I could only do with a 10 meter telescope. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, uh, the search for brown dwarfs was intriguing because I studied red dwarfs and so on. Um, and we knew that, um, that one thing about brown dwarfs, because they don't uh, ignite hydrogen, 
they would also uh, not destroy lithium. It turns out lithium is easier to destroy than, than hydrogen, or I should say regular hydrogen. Mm -hmm. What brown dwarfs do do is they'll, they'll destroy heavy hydrogen, or what's called deuterium. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they do have some fusion. They, they fuse the deuterium, but there's not much in the, in the universe, so they run out of that uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, the next thing to burn would be lithium. Uh, and red dwarfs certainly do that uh, early on, but brown dwarfs wouldn't be able to. And we knew that young brown dwarfs would be the, the brightest they're going to get and the hottest they're going to get, so they should be the easiest to find. Um, and we could tell the difference between a brown dwarf and a, and a star if we could measure lithium. Ah. The star would have destroyed it and the brown dwarf wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, you had to take a spectrum, and a pretty high resolution spectrum, and for that, you needed a big telescope. And so I was like, okay, great. And I, got, I got a big telescope. Right. Uh, let's see if we can't, uh, can't make this work. And so uh, I did uh, in 1995. Uh, as often happens in science, uh, there's another way to, to find brown dwarfs, which would be, okay, they're really hard to find sort of just floating out there. But you know, if you had a brown dwarf that was orbiting a star, um, then you could figure out what the star's properties were and if the other object there uh, was cooler than a star could possibly be, mm -hmm. uh, then that should be a brown dwarf too. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we look at very, near, very, very nearby stars and look for these brown dwarf companions, maybe we'd find one that way. And it turned out uh, that another group, which was trying to use that technique, had success uh, the same year. So there was a year uh, in which brown dwarfs were found. Uh, I was one of the discoverers and they were the other. And it didn't get nearly as much press as it might have gotten otherwise, because that same year was also the first year that uh, the first extrasolar planet was found. Ah, the, right. The press was all over that. Okay. <laughs> so they didn't have okay. time for brown dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> but it still must have felt it still must have felt incredible. It was, you know, the the night that I uh, reduced my spectrum and saw the the lithium line, I was like, okay, just at this moment, I'm like the only guy who knows for sure you know, where a brown dwarf is. In the universe. I don't know, well, at least on the earth anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that was very exciting. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Well, that's really wonderful. That's really great. And, uh, you know, I, I think maybe our audience from now on, whenever they read about, about brown dwarf stars, will have a really, uh, will have heard a really great story about their discovery. So I want to shift gears if we can, uh, Gabor, because You've also done a tremendous amount of work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, not only for UC Berkeley, uh, but for a number of other uh, organizations as well, but a, a tremendous amount of work at UC Berkeley. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you were named vice chancellor uh, for this work uh, at UC Berkeley uh, in 2006, and you spent eight years doing a lot of that kind of work. Um, and I mean, we know that historically there have been a, a tremendous inequities in sciences and the sciences for people of color. Were there ch challenges for you uh, along your journey? And what did you do to overcome uh, some of those challenges? Can you give us an example? Well, of course, the, the main challenge in a sense, I mean, before, before I was uh, like in high school and college, the, the main challenge was they didn't admit people of color into institutions like Berkeley, essentially. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so that there, there was just straight out, you know, uh, discrimination, mm -hmm. um, and everybody was okay with that. <laughs> at least, yeah. at least people running them, mm -hmm. institutions were. Uh, so, so, so luckily, you know, Martin Luther King came along while I was, uh, you know, in in uh, grade school and high school, and and Civil Rights Act was passed and so on. Mm -hmm. So I just sneaked in, uh, you know, into the first time where it was at least reasonably plausible that I could could do this. Um, before that, uh, it was just not, not happening. But what that meant, of course, was that um, people of color had a tendency to not think of science as something they were going to be doing because they didn't know anybody who did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, when opportunities weren't really there. Sure. Um, and and it, it's challenging when you're the only person, you know, in the room all the time, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then people, you know, wonder what you're doing there and, you know, wonder how you got there and whether yeah. you belong there. Right. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in science, you know, the good news is uh, there's 
generally one right answer and lots of wrong answers. And if you got the right answer, you know, who's you can't really argue with that. So, right. um, huh. you know, it's, uh, it, that's, that's not as hard, I would say, as, as fields where it's more subjective and, you know, a matter of opinion, <laughs> uh, then people can, can kind of dig in, but do, uh, least, but, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's all right. No, I was just going to say, uh, do these inequities still exist? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, they do. I mean, people are, are working on them. Uh, but I, I have, uh, you know, when I graduated uh, with my doctorate, I, I believe I was the only African American in the country who got a doctorate in astrophysics that year. Oh, my gosh. And when you look at the statistics, wow. it's not a lot better than that now. Wow. <laughs> so, the number of PhDs in astrophysics that go to, to black astronomers has typically been zero, one, or two nationally um, mm -hmm. up to up to recently. Uh, you know, it's, it hasn't gotten much better now even. Wow. So yeah, it's it's still a uh, still an issue. Do you see that changing in the future? I think it will. Um, I think that uh, people are being much more explicit in the last decade or so. I mean about how this has just persisted and persisted and persisted uh, and that they're going to have to do more work really to overcome this tremendous historical barrier that's been there. Um, you know, and the, the, the work has to be done by all sides. The, 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 you know, school kids need to start thinking of science as something they could do. Um, and the teachers need to start thinking that they could <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm, right, and right. Them. Uh, and, uh, and so, so on and so forth up the, so, up the line. So starting with higher ed, um, what, are the, what are the top three things that you might suggest that schools should do to try to make their programs uh, more inclusive? You mean uh, colleges? Yeah. Well, uh, part of it is, is the, the faculty. Um, so when people arrive at an institution and everybody on the faculty is a white male, they, they tend to think, okay, uh, yeah, well, that's not something I'm going to be doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, diversifying the faculty is, is part of it. Sure, um, of course. Mm -hmm. Another part of it is to um, appreciate and recognize and act on the positive things that diversity brings to higher education. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but there's, there, there are really deep seated arguments about this. Affirmative action, for example, uh, in my opinion, is something that should be happening. Uh, you know, it, it's just to make up for this incredibly uh, destructive action <laughs> that yeah. went on for a couple hundred years. You know, it's right. so if you're going to overcome that in less than another couple hundred years, <laughs> you need to actually do something positive uh, mm -hmm. to, to help with it. So, in my opinion, um, uh, affirmative action, not not where unqualified people get put in just because of their of course, identity, no. right. which affirmative action never was. But that, you know, that was the uh, that was yeah. the albatross that was hung around its neck. And then everybody was like, oh, OK, well, we don't like that. Right. Uh, even though that wasn't what was happening. Right. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to kind of get over that. I, I'm not I'm not terribly optimistic about that particular thing, but it, mm -hmm. it would be a good thing. To okay. do. Um, California just had a chance to Re reaffirm affirmative action and, and did not take it. And California is a pretty liberal state. That's so surprising, yeah. It's a, it's a, that's, a, that's a hard road. Yeah, yeah um, that's not a good step. And then um, I think the other, the other thing, and this does happen, is you need, if you recognize that students who come from you know, urban settings where the schools are not, um, not funded at the same level as elite private schools, um, that the institution can help students come up to speed. So you should only admit smart students, uh, but they may not have had the same privileged education that some of the other students had, yeah. but they can do it uh, yeah. if you give them the chance. Uh, mm -hmm. And so giving them the chance is, is another part of the, what has to happen. And you know, Berkeley has done a reasonable job at that and our, our graduation rates are, are pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, for our students of color and our first generation students and so on. Mm -hmm. They're not equal, uh, but they're pretty good. They're much better than, most, <laughs> than in most places. And that's because uh, we put some, some effort into that. So those, uh, those are the three things I would say. Great, I was gonna ask you, uh, what could be done earlier at the grade school level to make science more inclusive 
uh, and and make you know science you know careers yeah. uh, better options for students. Well, one thing would be if we had lots of better science teachers who also thought that all their students could be scientists mm -hmm. and who understood science well enough to teach it as the exciting activity that it really is. Yeah. Instead of like, oh no, you got to memorize all these things, and you know, uh, I you know I. I don't know why, but you know, I, I actually think our, our math education needs some revision as well. We, I'll agree with that. And a lot of time teaching kids stuff they're never going to use. I know that because I'm an astrophysicist and I never even used it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we could be teaching them, you know, critical thinking and statistics and things that they will use. Uh, and in science, I think what we need, what we should be teaching is, is the how exciting the process is. And yes. Not, not here's a whole bunch of facts, but rather right. here's how people have gone about learning things. Uh, and, uh, and boy, is it exciting, you know, and, and here, let's do this fun thing and that fun thing. Well, you know, when I listen to you talk about the work that you've done, it really does sound very much like that. Really exciting, yeah. a lot of fun. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, there have been exactly. these wonderful opportunities to, you know, make these, these new observations. And it sounds like it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding. <laughs> it certainly is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is, it's also rewarding because you're, you, I mean, another thing I, I do, of course, is teach. And so teaching, is, you know, is also rewarding. And then I have students who are uh, studying to be scientists and I'm, I'm teaching them. I'm giving them experience, you know, uh, with me. Uh, we work on stuff together. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, the whole thing is pretty, pretty rewarding. <laughs> So I have, uh, I have one last question for you. And then we actually have some questions for you from our audience, if you don't mind, oh, Gabor. No, I don't mind at all. OK, so here's my last question for you about this. Um, what do you think can be done for the population as a whole to make science more inclusive? I mean, I know that's a big thing, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's what I, I think it's what I said before. I think the, uh, the way science is taught the, the uh, needs to change. Uh, you know, a lot of science could be taught as uh, for a given community, how they're gonna solve issues that are, you know, are right there in front of them. Uh, you know, what, whatever it is, pollution or, you know, energy or, um, uh, you know, uh, illness, uh, all these things <laughs> we attack with, with science. And you could teach the science in the, in the course of talking about how the community needs the science and how the community could be involved in it and, and you know what what and what we have to know to do this and you know mm -hmm. so what's good to learn about this so you could do this and you know i think uh, just make it far more engaging would be probably the way to get it to be more inclusive um and the other thing that has to happen of course is people need to start seeing uh role models more and more they have to see that oh yeah people who are older than me uh studied this and are doing it and are having yeah. fun and are being successful and so yeah i could do that too that would be the other the other thing that needs to happen well i certainly hope that um, lots of young students get a chance to hear and see you in the work that you're doing so that they can be inspired i mean the way that you tell this story and the excitement about this topic that you have i'm sure is infectious and uh i would imagine that plenty of students have really enjoyed spending time uh, working with you. Well, I certainly hope so, yeah. Well, we have, I think we have a couple of questions, Gabor. So uh, let me check in with Linda and see what we have. Deshaun would like to know, what are his two favorite planets to visit in the future? <laughs> so uh, Deshaun is asking, what would be your two favorite planets that you might want to visit in the future? Uh, is that is this question restricted to our solar system, or do I get to go to other stars? No, no, Gabor, you get to go wherever you like to go. That's fine. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I'll, I'll pick one of these. So um, probably Mars would be my favorite planet to visit uh, in this solar system. Okay. Uh, because you know it's kind of Earth-like, mm -hmm. uh, and it we know that it had uh, water early in its in its existence, and we had a better atmosphere and better temperatures. And it would be really, really interesting to know whether life started there. Oh, uh, yes, um, indeed. That's true. Because if life did start on Mars independently, uh, then it pro almost certainly means the universe is just absolutely chock full of life. We yeah. have two planets in one solar system, and they both 
started life, then boy, that's, you know, that's, a, that'd be amazing. That would the, be exciting. The fun kicker there is we might discover that uh, life did start on Mars and then it migrated to the Earth. <laughs> we're, all, we're all Martians. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually a possibility. But uh, yeah, that's true. It is a possibility. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. And what's your what's your other planet? Yeah, the other planet I'd like to visit is is like uh, one of these um, Earth-sized planets around uh, nearby red dwarfs, the the, the Trappist planet system. For oh example, yeah, Trappist one, mm -hmm. uh, because those are actually far more common than an Earth-sized planet around a sun-sized star. Um, but there, there are a lot of uh, issues about those planets. And when, when you put them at the right distance from the red dwarf so that they could have you know, pleasant conditions on the surface, pleasant by our standards anyway, mm -hmm. um, there are issues around stellar magnetic activity, the thing that I study that might make the planets uninhabitable. So I, I would love to know the answer to that is like, uh, are all these red dwarf Earth-sized planets habitable or not habitable? <laughs> yeah. That would also make a huge difference for how, how you know how much life is out there. So yeah, those yeah. would be my two choices. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, uh, we'll take another one. Baxter would like to know: Are there planetary systems around brown dwarfs? Baxter is asking if there are planetary systems around brown dwarfs. Yeah, well, we'd all like to know that. Um, <laughs> We, <laughs> so that's a current topic of research. So, you know, uh, if he was a, a, you know, a postdoc or something, he could be working on that problem right now. There are people working on it. Um, we think so. The, the answer is we think so. We don't see any reason why not, because we see brown dwarfs in formation have disks of gas and dust uh, around them too. And, and it, it looks like when you get a disk like that, you get planets uh, yeah. pretty commonly. Mm -hmm. um, so, so pro I would say the answer is quite probably. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the a planet around a brown dwarf has a problem, <laughs> which is that its its star is constantly getting fainter. Yeah. So Whoa. wherever you put the planet, it, it might be nice there for a while, but eventually it's going to be too cold there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but you know, the, the time scales here are, are long. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. But the, the answer the answer is almost certainly there are planets around dwarfs, but we don't really know of any good ones yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll take another one. Estrella would like to say thank you to Gabor for mentioning that mentoring teachers is also another way to support children and get them excited about science. Ah, I don't know if you could hear that, Gabor. I I, I think I heard it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, teach, teachers are super critical. <laughs> absolutely super critical none yeah. of this happens without good good teaching exactly yes exactly one more hun okay well we have two more but okay alan's asks are there brown dwarfs only made of hydrogen or do they have other elements in them besides lithium other elements in those brown dwarfs besides uh, lithium yeah so brown dwarfs are made out of the same interstellar clouds that anything else is made out of so they, they have all the same elements that um that the sun does for example um, and, and, and mostly in the same proportions originally, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but as, as I mentioned, you know, some, a few elements get destroyed early on like lithium. So uh, they still have it, but the sun, the sun doesn't uh, have it nearly as much. Um, uh, but for the most part, yeah, it's the same, it's the same stuff. You, okay. you start with the same, same pot of ingredients and you make a little thing or a bigger thing. Ah, right. Okay. Right. That's the important part. The little thing or the bigger thing. Right. Uh, I think we have one more. Deshaun asked Dr. Basri, what is the best advice to give future scientists or astrophysicists when they are struggling and how they can overcome it? Best advice for uh, future astronomers, uh, candidates and astrophysicists. astrophysicists. Yes, go ahead, Gabor. Yeah, my best advice is that uh, this isn't something you do on your own. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, uh, and people make this mistake all, all along the way. Science is, is not easy uh, because, because there's one right answer. You can, it's easy to get the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you be careful. Um, and sometimes things are a little hard to understand. And so the best thing to do is to uh, study with, with friends or uh, tutors or whatever, uh, not to think that, oh, oh the, the task here is that I have to figure all this out by myself with no help. That is not the task. <laughs> the task is to end up understanding it. Uh, and the best way to do that is, is with help, with, with friends, with 
good teacher with you know tutors what whatever you've got and you know it depends on what level of education you're at but whatever it is uh, get get help do it with other people have fun together uh, and then you'll make it astronomy as a team sport astronomy is a team sport yeah <laughs> That was from Deshaun. Deshaun, thanks a lot for that really great question. Uh, Gabor Basri, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It was really wonderful having you. And uh, the work that you've done is incredible, amazing. And I can only imagine that with the discovery of so many new planet candidates orbiting other stars, uh, your mind must reel with ideas for science fiction <laughs> stories and movies and all sorts of things that's, like that. That's true, actually. That's, yeah, about right the possibilities. That. Well, so, thanks so much for uh, inviting me onto your program. I really sure, sure, great. And uh, hopefully we can have you back again sometime in the future. I'd be perfectly willing. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Gabor. Thanks, bye everyone. Take care. Bye. Okay, well, that was really wonderful to have Dr. Gabor Basri, who is a uh, professor emeritus now at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, telling us about his work uh, in astronomy and also telling us about some of the challenges that he faced uh, with diversity, equity, and inclusion and some of the work that he's done at UC Berkeley helping the school to improve uh, its, uh, its making itself accessible to students of color. Uh, it's really important that we look at this issue all across the country because of course, as we just said, astronomy is a team sport. You know, the more players you have, the better you can be. And so uh, this is a, a, a really good thing for us to get across an important message for uh, people of color in science and for science in general. The more minds we have, the better off we can, uh, we can understand the university we live in. So very, very grateful to Gabor for being with us. So we still have a lot more to do this evening, folks. We wanna take some more of your questions, but we also wanna cover some other topics that we spoke about a little bit earlier. Uh, one of those I wanna make sure we get to is uh, I wanted to take a look at a map of the night sky so that we can put into place for you the constellations that are visible right now so that you can identify them as you go out. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna share my screen so that uh, I can go over and take a look at uh, what's there. Let me see if I can do this. Uh, here I am right here. Uh, good, I'm on screen sharing. And here's what I'm gonna do folks is I'm gonna go to uh, my favorite program for this, which is stellarium-web.org. You've seen me use this program a number of times. This is a product created by Stellarium that works as a uh, web portal that you can use to look at the night sky. Now I've opened my screen a little bit so that you can see this. And um, I'll give you the quick orientation for this and then we'll take a look at what's available to be seen. So uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. Hopefully you'll see I have a nice starscape. I'm looking toward the north in this and I'm using my cursor right now to show you where north is. You can see the letter N down on the horizon here. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to drag my cursor so that I can rotate the sky around and I'm gonna bring us around to south, just like this. So we can see where we are here. And I'll point out that the icons at the bottom of the screen allow me to add various components that help me understand how the sky is laid out. Over on the far right side, you'll see that there's a clock over here. And this is the device that I use to change my time or my date or move forward in time, move backward in time. So that's this box right here. It's shown in what's called military time right over here. So 2047, it's the current time, 847 PM. So I'm gonna close that back because we're not gonna use that right now. And of course my location is Philadelphia over here and you can adjust that for any place you like around the world and that'll work just fine. So as we're looking out toward the South at this point, we have set ourselves up so that we can see the sky as it appears when we go out to take a look, if we face South, Objects will appear to rise over on the eastern side, pass overhead, and set over in the west. So first of all, let's take a look for the brightest objects we can see. And of course, Mars is still high in the west-southwestern sky right over here. So that's easy to see. Of course, its pink color makes it stand out. So it's uh, very easy to identify. But right in the center of the sky, we have the winter circle of stars, the winter circle of stars centering right on Orion the Hunter that's right here in the center of the screen. And I'm going to just take two fingers and drag this to make it a little bit closer for us so that I can identify the main star components here. 
And uh, then we'll show you the shape that we see here. Orion is seven bright stars, three that make up this belt right across here, two up at the top above the belt that describe Orion's left shoulder and Orion's right shoulder. Betelgeuse is the name of the red giant star at his right shoulder. Uh, Bellatrix is the star that marks his left shoulder. Rigel is his right ankle, if you will. Over here on this side is his left knee, and this is uh, Saif over here. And the three stars in the middle here are called Mo, Larry, and Curly. No, I'm just kidding. Alnalam, Alnatak, and Nintaka. Mintaka are those three stars. Alnalam, Alnatak, and Mintaka are those three stars. And the seven stars all together make up the shape that we know of as Orion the Hunter. So right here is the top of the body, the lower legs of the body, and here's the uh, belt right at his waist here. It seems as though there's a sword hanging from the belt of Orion, these three stars right down here. This is actually the Orion Nebula. It's one of the only, one of the few nebulas that's easily observed with a pair of binoculars uh, in the evening sky. And if you're under clear dark skies, you can just begin to see some of the nebulosity as you're just looking at the sky with the naked eye, but binoculars will certainly enhance that without much difficulty at all. Again, the orange glow of the red giant star Betelgeuse is also easy to identify. And so that's how you can see that shape there. I'll back out just a little bit because I wanna bring up the constellations that surround Orion and I'm gonna use the constellation shapes to show that. So I've just activated this with the constellation triangle at the bottom. And here we can see Orion right at the center. There's that shoulder star here, another shoulder star here, the belt, and then the lower limb stars that you see there. Orion is facing the west. Oops, my bad, sorry about that. There we go. Orion is facing the west. And if you look just above his left shoulder, you'll find the constellation Taurus. Taurus, that zodiac constellation of the winter sky that we know so well that also has a red giant star at this bright star here called Aldebaran. Aldebaran is the brightest star of the constellation Taurus, and that's a red giant as well. And so you can easily recognize this group of stars because the face of Taurus the bull is actually a V-shaped group of stars. So I've zoomed in again so that you can see that V-shaped group of stars. And just off to the west of that are the Pleiades. This is one of those star clusters that Dr. Basri was able to alter our understanding of the aging of by understanding how to measure lithium in young stars. Uh, so that's the Pleiades. It looks like a little tiny dipper and you can see that without too much difficulty. The other constellations that are part of this uh, winter circle group, if we go from Taurus just above a little bit to the north, we come to Auriga the charioteer. Its brightest star Capella we see right here is very easy to recognize without too much difficulty. If we come around to the east, we'll find the constellation Gemini, the other zodiac group with its two twin stars at the heads of the, of the bodies of the twins. Uh, Pollux and Castor mark those stars, mark the heads of the twins. And the feet of the twins are down here, a bit fainter, but if you're under dark skies, you'll be able to follow the chain from the head down to the feet so you can identify the twins. If we come a little bit further around, this bright star here called Procyon is the brightest star in the constellation Canis Minor. The little dog is the translation of that, Canis Minor, the little dog. And then down here, Canis Major with its bright star Sirius is the other one of Orion's hunting dogs. So we have these constellations that surround Orion and that makes up the winter circle. To get started with this, I recommend using a map like this to recognize the shape or learn to recognize the shape of a constellation. Find that one on the first night. And then on the next night, look at the shape of another constellation, an adjacent one. Try to memorize what that looks like and then go out and see if you can find your original one, then your following one. And if you do that over the course of say 10 to 12, clear evenings, you'll have most of the constellations of the sky where you live without much difficulty at all. That's a great way to find those stars. I should point out that Sirius, Sirius is the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere sky. No other star is brighter than Sirius. And it's actually relatively close. It's only eight light years away from us, just eight light years away from us. If we turn that around the other way, the light we see tonight left that star eight years ago. So if you happen to be eight years old this year, this month, today, 
the light you see today left that star on your birthday. So that's the way it is. It's that far away. So those are the constellations that we can see in the southern portion of the sky right now. And what I'm going to do is tilt things up here a little bit. I'll get rid of the artwork. We're going to take a look, look over toward the western side of the sky, where we can see those constellations left over from the fall just heading down in the west over here, the great square of Pegasus and Perseus being the major ones, along with the constellation Cassiopeia that looks like an, an upside down M or a W right over here in the west, heading down on the western side. If we grab the sky and pull it back around a little bit, come past south, we can see that the major constellation that heralds the coming of spring, Leo the lion is making its way up in the eastern sky right now, even as we speak. And just above that, a little bit off toward the north, is probably one of the best known star groupings of the sky, Ursa Major, the big bear, where we find that well-known asterism of the sky, the Big Dipper. So there's the Big Dipper right there, part of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. So that takes care of that for that portion of the sky. So this map that I'm using, as I said, is part of Stellarium Web. You can actually use Stellarium on your smartphone as a really wonderful way to uh, carry a star map out in, under the evening sky with you. There are a number of different smartphone apps that show the night sky. All of them do pretty much the same thing. The questions you have to answer are, which artwork uh, that's employed do you like? And do you wanna spend money or do you wanna do it for free? Stellarium is a free app, but there are a number that you can purchase that provide layers of information that you can add on. It's your choice as to which one you'd like to use. Most of them, uh, the ones I found, all provide the same information. So uh, they're all, all pretty good in that respect. So you can make your choice. While we're here on this particular screen, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna uh, drop out of this for just one second. I'm gonna let that go. I'm gonna switch over to one other program I have here. And my other program here is Heavens Above that shows us uh, how we can see International Space Station available in the evening sky. You can see up here the URL heavens-above.com, heavens-above.com. If you go to that URL, you can then scan down through the menu to find International Space Station. I've already logged in, so we can see what our location is up in the top right corner over here. And I'm gonna go back over here to the menu where I'm gonna select International Space Station. And I see that I've had, I have five options in the list, two for tonight, one for tomorrow, one for Saturday, and one for Monday. Well, I'm gonna skip this other one for tonight at eight o'clock because it was only 12 degrees above the horizon at its highest point. I'm gonna look at tomorrow where I see there is a pass. It's not very bright and it's only 20 to 23 degrees above the horizon. And I also know the weather's not gonna be that good tomorrow night. So I'm gonna go right to Saturday, February 6th where I see there is a brighter one, negative 2.4, which means it's quite bright. And it's at 6.25 PM it begins. Three minutes later, it'll be at its maximum altitude of 39 degrees. And here's a map that shows me its path across the night sky. You can access this too, print it out, take it out with you to use. And it shows you at what time it will be making its pass across the sky and what constellations it will be passing through. So you can see at 828, it reaches its maximum height in the sky as it heads on over to the southeastern portion of the sky. One other really cool thing that this does is it shows us a ground track so that we can orient ourselves as to which way to look to see it as it passes by. So the ground track here now shows us the dot is Philadelphia right here. And we can see that this is coming down from the Northwest, passing Southwest of us, and then heading out to the Southeast. So this is heavens-above.com. You can use that one. And then I've, as I've mentioned before, one of the other links that I use that I find quite helpful for this is See a Satellite Tonight. The See a Satellite Tonight app is also very helpful for this. And I've mentioned before that that is found at james.darpinion.com slash satellites. But just do a search for See a Satellite Tonight, and that will make it possible for you to see that. Okay, so folks, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We'll take a few more questions. So if we have some more questions, Linda, what do we have? Yes, we do. 
Mike would like to know what are your two planets to visit in the future? Oh, Mike wants to know what are my two favorite planets that I would want to visit in the future? Well, one of the planets I'd love to visit, like Gabor, is Mars. And the reason why I'd like to go to Mars is because, as Gabor said, it's very much like Earth, but I'm interested in the Martian geology. I'd like to get out and do walking tours or hikes uh, 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 through the Martian ge geology and geography just to see how close it is to Earth geology and geography. I know that there are certain landforms, that there are a number of incredible landforms on Mars that have never been seen before, and I would love to be uh, among the first to actually walk among some of those landforms on Mars. Many of them are much greater in size than they are here on Earth. Uh, and I'd love to have an opportunity to take a look and take a look at them and uh, also have a chance to take a look at some of the places on Mars where uh, we found that water existed in, you know, in enormous quantities uh, in the past. I'd love to see that. The other planet I might like to visit, um, you know, even though it's not possible to land there, I'd still like to travel out to Saturn. I think it would be just a spectacular view to see the rings and to see the cloud tops of Saturn. So I'd love to go out and do that. Those are my two. Okay, what's next? Lori says she loves hearing you on the Preston and Steve show. Thank you so much because you explain things so well. Oh, thanks, Lori. Yeah, I enjoy being on Preston and Steve. Those guys are a lot of fun. And we, uh, I think we do a lot of good work together. And I look forward to my next opportunity to be on with them. Uh, they're smart guys. And we have a lot of fun working together. So thanks a lot for that, Lori. What else do you have? Ma Layden says, is Pluto a planet or not? Ma Layden? Oh, Ma Layden is asking about Pluto, whether or not it's a planet. Between you and me, here's what I say. I say, yes, it is. Why? Because as it turns out, when we flew by Pluto in 2016 with the New Horizons spacecraft, we discovered all sorts of incredible characteristics about that planet that we never knew before. And we can see that it behaves like any other planet. It's in orbit around the sun. It's big enough to have pulled itself into a spherical shape and it's cleared its orbit of all kinds of other debris. Three main characteristics of how we define a planet. So in my mind, it's a planet. Now, a few years ago, its classification was changed to make it a dwarf planet. Not so much because of its size, because as it turns out, we found objects out beyond Pluto that are its size or bigger. We're gonna to have to figure out how to classify them. But the reason why its designation was changed is because we've come to realize that Pluto is not one of the original planets of our solar system. We started out, we probably started out with many, many more, but the dynamics of the early solar system brought us down to a basic set of eight planets. And then Pluto was captured by the gravitational pull of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune into an orbit around the sun. And here we are now with what I consider to be nine planets. We'll see how that changes in the future though. One last one. Little Serafina would like to know, what is your favorite constellation? Ah, hello, Serafina. Thanks for joining us tonight. I understand you want to know what my favorite constellation is. Well, you know, that's a really hard one. And it's a hard one for me because uh, there's so many cool things to see in all the different constellations. But I think probably one of my favorite constellations in the evening sky uh, is the constellation uh, Pegasus and Andromeda. The two actually go together. They're found in the evening sky. And the reason why I like those two constellations is because that's one location where a spiral galaxy is visible to the naked eye under clear, dark skies. Certainly, a, a pair of binoculars will help that, but just observing that galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy under clear, dark skies with my own eyes, I find remarkable, Serafina, because of the fact that if I can see that galaxy, I'm seeing light that has traveled 2.9 million years to get here. So I'm seeing the galaxy as it looked 2.9 million years ago, and I'm detecting it with my own eyes. I really love that idea. So that's my favorite right there. Okay, well, folks, we come to the conclusion of another wonderful opportunity for us to learn about the night sky. I really thank you for your questions. If you have additional questions, please continue to send them. I'll jump into the uh, comments section and I'll try to answer all of your questions. So if you still have questions, throw them in there. If we didn't get to them, 
throw them in there. I'll make sure that we get to them. And uh, just keep in mind a couple of things. As we mentioned, great constellations for you to see. Don't forget to go out and look at the planet Mars. International Space Station is going to be available on Saturday evening. And uh, spring is coming. You can tell because at this time of evening, the constellation Leo the Lion has already risen above the eastern horizon. And that means that spring is not far behind. Just six short weeks from now is when we'll arrive at that wonderful time where all the snow will be gone and we'll be back into spring. So get out there and take a look at the night sky. A couple of things just to remind you of. Don't forget, the Franklin Institute is open for you to come visit. Go to our website, www.fi.edu, where you can find out all the information you need to know about our COVID-19 uh, safety protocols that allow us to be in the building. And we have a brand new exhibit coming up a little bit later this month, the Crayola exhibit. And let me tell you, it's way more than crayons. Don't get that idea in mind that it's about crayons. It's about way more than that. And you're going to really enjoy it. It'll be wonderful. So I really encourage you to consider coming to check that out. So come visit us at the Franklin Institute. We'd love to see you there again soon. Don't forget, as I said before, some of the most important things you can keep in mind right now, folks, is wear a mask and get a vaccine. Get vaccinated. Please do that. It's important for everybody all around. Don't forget, being out under the night sky is a great way for you to decompress, a great way to, for you to relax, a great way for you to reconnect with the universe. You don't need tools to do this. Just go outside and use your eyes to see it. Suggest to family members that you go out and you do this as maybe a Zoom event. You can do it together and you can observe the night sky from wherever you are. Even if you're right smack dab downtown in Center City, Philadelphia, there's still plenty for you to see. If you got a pair of binoculars as a holiday gift, take a look at the moon. It looks really great through a pair of binoculars. Next month, we're gonna jump right into telescopes and talk about those. We'll also have another special guest for you uh, next month looking at aspects of astronomy and access to astronomy. And I'm sure you'll find that person fascinating as well. Thanks a lot for joining us here. My name is Derek Pitts. I'm the chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum. You're cool astronomer. You can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at cool astronomer. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you again next time. Good night. Have a great month of February. We'll see you next March. Okay, well, we got 